Welcome everyone. This webinar will begin shortly. Before we proceed, we wanted to go over a few items with you. Uh, we want this to be an interactive session. We have some great content to share with you and great tips about the programs and resources of a variety of NIH programs, some of our partners, but we want you to share your questions with us. So even while we're talking, feel free to drop a Q&A, a, a, a question, and we'll answer it during the Q&A period. We are offering closed captioning and Zoom technical support, and we'd like to make sure we collect your feedback. This helps us to improve our programming and find out what more you need to know to be successful. You'll be able to see the feedback form link in chat. And then we also invite you to join the conversation and follow us on Twitter, which is now X. So during this webinar, we're gonna have a variety of resources that we'll put in the chat box. Don't worry about copying them all. We, we will send an email with several of these resources and we'll also have them on our respective websites. However, if you would like to save the chat, you can do so by checking, uh, clicking on the ellipsis, which are the three dots in chat, and you'll be able to save them to your computer. With that, I'd like to welcome you to the Entrepreneurial and Product Development Support for Academic and Small Business Innovators. We'll have a wonderful webinar planned. We do have a variety of co-hosts, and this is an opportunity to bring you feedback and top tips from four institutes across NIH, the NCATS, Office of Strategic Alliances, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute Small Business Program, the National Cancer Institute Small Business Development Program, and we also have the National Institute on Aging Small Business Programs. You'll hear from more of that, more about them and the resources shortly. We're also very thankful for our co-hosts today, we are joined by the Center for Technology Commercialization in Wisconsin, as well as the Wisconsin Women in Biohealth. Today, we have a variety of featured speakers. You'll hear from Margaret Ramey. She's the Interim Director of the Wisconsin Center for Technology Commercialization. April Hughes, she's BioForward's Women in Biohealth. Mina Rajagopal, Dr. Vajagopal is the program officer at the NCATS small business team. You'll also hear from Stephanie Davis. She leads the small business programs at NHLBI. In addition to Dr. Davis and the others I mentioned, you will be joined by Dr. Joshua Hooks. He is the program officer at the Office of Strategic Extramural Programs at the National Institute on Aging, Dr. Saroj Regmi, Program Director at the SBIR Development Center at NCI. And my name is Monique LaRock Ashton. I'm from Ogilvy Health, and I'll be your moderator for today. Just to give an overview of the information you'll be receiving, we'll be learning more about CTC Wisconsin and BioForce Women in BioHealth. We'll be going specifically through each of the NCATS, NHLBI, NIA, and NCI, SBIR, and NCTR programs and then we'll be leading a moderated Q&A. With that, I'd like to welcome Margaret Ramey. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Margaret Ramey with the Wisconsin Center for Technology Commercialization. I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to have so much representation from NIH today. It is very important to us to spread the word about the SBIR program and how helpful it is. So, so also thank you program managers and coordinators um, from, the in, from NIH that'll be speaking during this webinar too. Um, next slide. So my organization, the Center for Technology Commercialization is Wisconsin's no cost SBIR resource. We are a part of UW system and are partially funded by the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. So all of our consulting, all of our programs, and all of our um, events are free. Um, so this, um, our organization, sorry, <laughs> provides training programs, events, and grants to Wisconsin small businesses pursuing SBIR funding. So if you're a Wisconsin researcher, innovator, or small business considering the SBIR program, definitely come and talk to one of us first. So you might ask, why is that? Well, 
um, we provide grants, like I said. So um, small businesses in Wisconsin are eligible for up to three, almost up to $300,000 in grants that we manage to pursue phase one and phase two programming. So those come in forms of grants that you can use to hire a grant consultant to help you write. And then also in, in the form of uh, SBIR match grants. So once you have a phase one in hand, we will, it's a competitive program, but you could be awarded up to $275,000 to cover costs that the SBIR program doesn't allow. Um, so definitely come to us um, and we'd be happy to talk to you about NIH or other um, agencies that also participate in the program. Um, and we'd be happy to help you get your program going. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so like I said, one of our free services is to provide training and events. These are a couple of um, exciting events we have coming up this fall. Um, it's a busy fall for us. So if you'd like to attend, again, they're free, um, sign up for our newsletter. The link is right there on the slide. Um, we'd be happy to have any or all of you join. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. And then again, um, if you go to our website and click on the request for counseling, um, it is a, a form that will also establish an NDA. So doing this process will get you in touch with one of our consultants um, and then also make sure we're confidential. So we would love to have any questions. Um, come to us via email or contact us through the request for counseling. So. That's all I have. Now we can get on to more interesting things. Um, I'll hand things to April. Uh, thank you so much for your time and thanks again for joining. Thank you, Margaret, for sharing the information about CTC. Uh, my name is April Hughes and I am here to represent Women in Biohealth. I'm one of the co-founders of the organization. On next slide, please. And one more. All right. So what is Women in Biohealth? So Women in Biohealth essentially is a, an affinity group, a community affinity group. It is not a nonprofit. We, we are not a, a membership organization. You don't need to pay dues or need to be part of the membership to, to attend. Um, but we are using BioForward Wisconsin as our fiscal agent to represent women in biohealth so we can get sponsorship for events and, and stuff like that. But we are, we are connected, but we are not uh, necessarily owned or, or anything like that by BioForward Wisconsin, uh, you do not need to be a BioForward member to attend web events. Um, and again, because we are not a nonprofit, we're not, or we're not a membership, um, all of our events are free as well. Uh, the uh, mission of our organization is to connect and empower women in the biohealth community. So biohealth is a pretty broad um, area. It's biotech, biopharma, digital health or healthcare technologies, healthcare systems, med devices, diagnostics. Um, so biohealth in general, anything that just kind of touches biohealth. Um, but again, we have several uh, individuals who aren't necessarily part of the biohealth that also attend our events just because they are geared towards women identifying individuals. Um, but it is inclusive of all, all genders. So I, we do see gentlemen at our events as well. Um, for engagement, we, we do offer both professional development events as well as networking events for the community in Wisconsin. We're based out of Madison, but we do have some individuals in Milwaukee that, uh, that are pretty engaged in our program. Uh, we offer mentoring um, circles as well as a mentoring program specifically, um, and you can also find us on LinkedIn. Uh, we have, I think it's up to 600 plus members now because of our events, so feel free to follow us on LinkedIn or subscribe to our email list. Um, the things that we've been working on for 2023, we are revamping just a little bit and we formed four leadership teams that are dedicated to four different areas. Uh, those areas are community outreach, um, which also encompasses the educational system. So if we have individuals that are reaching out 
for um, representation in, in biohealth to come and do something for the schools that would go through our community outreach group. Um, we're also launching an advocacy group, which is currently focused on um, trying to elevate more women identifying individuals into board positions at both for-profit and nonprofit organizations. We also have a membership leader, or excuse me, a mentoring leadership team, which covers our mentorship program, as well as our mentoring circles, our networking circles. Um, and then we also have our professional development and working event, or excuse me, leadership team that plans our professional development and our networking events. Um, so those are all ways that you can get involved in the organization if you want to go above and beyond just attending some of the events. We are always recruiting for those four leadership teams. Um, if you are based in the Wisconsin area, uh, more specifically in, in the Madison area, you, you'll have uh, plenty of opportunities to get involved. Next slide, please. This is our steering committee for women in biohealth. Uh, we have several people on the steering committee that are part of the industry in general. So this was a grassroots effort that was put together by industry professionals because there was a need in the community to represent women identifying individuals. Um, so just calling out our wonderful steering committee that helps with the leadership teams and helps with the organization. Um, they've really brought it from the ground. Next slide, please. So thank you again for uh, joining this talk, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the presentations that are to come. If you want more information about women in biohealth, you can connect with us um, on our LinkedIn group, um, or you can go to womeninbiohealth.org and you can sign up for our mailing list. So thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you in the area. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And now I welcome Dr. Rajakapal from NCATS. Thank you, Monique. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. I want to start off by saying that NCATS is very happy to partner up with the Wisconsin Center for Technology Commercialization and BioForwards Women in BioHealth in this webinar. And I'm absolutely delighted to have my colleagues from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, National Cancer Institute, and the National Institute on Aging to speak about their institute-specific small business program interest and funding opportunities. Next, go to the next slide, please. So I am the program officer for the small business program within the Office of Strategic Alliances at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, NCATS for short. And NCATS is one of the 27 institutes at the NIH, and our mission is to promote research that would ultimately result in the development of more treatment options being made available to all patients more rapidly. We are a little different from the other institutes. And what I mean by that is we are not focused towards a particular disease or a body organ. Um, and our interest lies in accelerating the translational science process, again, to make sure that more treatments are made available to all patients more rapidly. Let's go to the next slide. So you've heard quite a, you know, a several times, um, you know, me mentioning translational sciences, right? So what is translational science? Translational science, as we define it here at NCATS, is the conversion of a basic science discovery that happens in a lab setting into health solutions that are made available to patients at the clinic or the market. So as you can imagine, this process is not straightforward or simple. Um, while there may be n number of putative therapeutics that have been identified in a lab setting, only, of the, only a fraction of this actually makes it to the other end of the pipeline to reach patients as shown in this animation here. Um, the different components that make up this translational science spectrum include, say, for instance, developing new, uh, new approaches, um, demonstrating their utility before disseminating the findings, right? And there are a number of roadblocks identified in each of those components, and NCATS wants to basically facilitate programs that not only identifies bottlenecks in the translational science pipeline, but also mitigates them, um, so ultimately leading to, to the development of more treatment options being made available to all patients more rapidly. So in the next slide, 
I just wanted to highlight a few of the solutions to these roadblocks that NCATS is currently working on. Uh, and by no means, this is an exhaustive list, right? For instance, NCATS would like to see if we can understand what is similar across a number of human diseases that can help us develop multiple treatments at the same time. Can we develop models to predict how a patient responds to treatment? And how can we better design clinical trials to make it more inclusive and diverse um, so that it accurately reflects the patient population? NCAT's mission is to clear the path to translational research projects um, move more quickly and easily on their way to becoming health solutions. Next slide, please. So towards this goal, NCATS manages and funds a number of initiatives, some of which are listed on the slide. In the interest of time, I'm not going to get into the details of it. And if you would like to learn more about these programs, please visit our NCATS website and read about them. Next slide, please. One more. Okay, now that I've talked about what, who we are and what we do at NCATS, I will dive into the small business program. So SBIR, which stands for the Small Business Innovation Research and STTR, an acronym for the Small Business Technology Transfer Research are both what's called America Seed Fund. It is a congressionally mandated program and is one of the largest sources of early stage uh, funding available to eligible US-based small businesses. A number of agencies participate in this program, including the FDA and the CDC, and the budget for the program typically tracks the agency's budget. So what this means at the NIH is that it, it totals to about um, $1.2 billion. That's billion with a B as in boy, um, that is shared among the participating institutes of the NIH. Next slide, please. So there are a number of advantages um, or reasons why a small business um, should apply to the NIH small business program, right? Like I said earlier, the budget tracks the agency's budget, hence it is stable and predictable. The funds are non-dilutive, meaning the IP rights belong to the company. And once awarded, there are several resources that me and my colleagues um, will talk about uh, that the small businesses can leverage to further develop their technology or product. One additional benefit to applying to the NIH small business program is the peer review process. So every application that comes to the small business program undergoes a rigorous peer review um, at the Center for Scientific Review. And what this allows for the small business is a chance or an opportunity to go outside of the NIH looking for funds and other collaborations because um, now your science of work is validated by guess who? The National Institutes of Health, right? So just wanted to highlight some of those benefits on applying to the NIH small business program. Let's go to the next slide. So I want to quickly touch upon the eligibility for small businesses to apply to the SBIR and STTR program. And I want to make you aware that the NIH has nothing to do with this eligibility criteria, right? It is in fact set forth by the US Small Business Administration. So according to the US Small Business Administration, a US-based small business with few 500 or fewer employees can apply uh, to the SBIR program the, uh, and the STTR program. The company should be owned by 50% or more, uh, should be owned 50% or more by individuals who are either um, US citizens or permanent residents of the United States. If there are multiple venture capitalist investments, these should not be more than 50%. And there are also some other requirements when it comes to the primary employment of the principal investigator which I'll get to in just a second. Next slide, please. So under the STTR program, the small business can collaborate with the US-based college or university. And it is very important that the small business um, has the proper paperwork in terms of licenses to use the technology that has been developed in a lab at the university for, for its commercialization purpose, right? And there are some additional requirements, again, which I will go over in my next slide. So here, I just wanted to highlight some of the key differences. Um, I'm sorry. Sanjana, is this the next slide? Okay. Okay, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I think it is. <laughs> okay, so, so here, I just wanted to um, highlight a few of the key differences uh, between the two programs. So under the SBIR, um, the small business is allowed to partner with the US um, based college or university, like I said earlier. And however, this is an absolute requirement if you want to apply under the STTR mechanism. 
There are also some work-related requirements that differentiate between the two programs. For instance, under the SBIR, the small business can outsource up to about 33% under a phase one and up to about 50% under a phase two. Um, I will explain what these four phases are in just a bit, in, in just a little bit. But under the STTR mechanism, a minimum of 40% of the proposed work has to be carried out at the small business, and at least 30% of the work should be done at the research institute. There are also differences in the primary employment of the principal investigator. So under the SBIR program, the primary employment which is at least 50% of time and effort has to be with of the principal investigator has to be with the small business. While there is some flexibility if you're coming under the STTR program where the primary employment of the principal investigator can be either with the small business or the nonprofit research institute. Please note that irrespective of what program you apply to, the award or the money always goes to the small business program. Next slide, please. So with this one, I just wanted to quickly make you aware of these special designations given to small businesses, right? And we highly encourage our applicants to self, to please self-identify because this information is actually tracked mainly to see if there, there needs to be more outreach done targeting these specific groups. So just wanted to bring it to your awareness that these special designations have been given to small businesses by the US Small Business Administration. Next slide, please. So now getting into the um, NIH small business program, right? Like I said, it's a phased program um, and we are looking for applications, you know, under the phase one, I'm sorry, we are actually looking for applications uh, that typically talk about a proof of concept or a feasibility study. The SBA set hard cap, uh, budget hard cap for a phase one is about $296,000, but each institutes each institute have their own um, topics of high interest that is within their, you know, our mission space. And we have what's called waiver topics. And if you wish to apply under one of those waiver topics, you can actually request a budget that is slightly above the SBA set hard cap. So at NCATS, um, you know, if you apply under one of those wa NCATS waiver topics, you can request up to about 350K for the phase one and about up to about $2.15 million for the phase two. So the phase two, again, is a full blown R&D type of application um, that has a commercialization plan built into it. Um, we also have what's called the phase 2B, and not all institutes participate in this program. Um, NCATS does, and this is where we would like to support our awardees, our applicants, get through a key inflection point, like say you need a state-of-the-art um, instrumentation or you're filing for an IND. We can provide those extra funds of up to a million dollars per year for three years. Um, the only caveat being NCATS uh, should have funded your phase 2. We are also participating in phase 2B funding opportunities led by NHLBI, and I will let my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Davis, talk about it. Then there's the phase three, which is the more commercialization part of the program, right? So this is where, say, if you were to apply to a different agency like the DOD, um, they would actually buy the tool or the technology from you. But NIH is never the customer. So at NCATS, we want our uh, awardees to, to think of an exit strategy and graduate out of the program. Let's go to the next slide. So here, I just wanted to highlight some of the different funding mechanisms that are available um, to small business entrepreneurs. Over 80% of the applications to the NIH small business program comes under the omnibus solicitation. And this is an investigated initiated grant funding mechanism. And there are typically three standard deadlines, uh, due dates. Um, the upcoming one is actually next week, September 5th, which is next week. Um, and each institute also uh, you know, they put out targeted funding announcements that are of high priority to them. So please check out our websites to learn more about it. And I will get to the last two, um, um, you know, funding opportunities on contract solicitations and commercialization readiness pilot in just a few minutes. So let's go to the next slide, please. So here, I wanted to give you a sense of the type of projects that NCAT's small business program has funded in the past. Um, our interest can broadly fall under these three buckets um, that's listed on the slide here. And each one of these three topics have multiple subtopics. So please visit our website to learn more about them. Uh, my colleague, uh, Melissa, is chatting out the link, so please check it out. Uh, the pie chart on the right shows that a majority of the projects um, where with the tools, you know, that we funded 
uh, fall, uh, fall under the tools for drug discovery and development. But we've also uh, funded projects in artificial intelligence and machine learning, rare diseases, devices, and clinical research tools. Next slide, please. So with this one, I just wanted to spotlight a few of the targeted funding announcements that is out there on the streets and we are currently accepting applications for. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into each of those in detail, but please um, check out our funding, uh, you know, the funding announcements. And if you have any questions, please reach out to the point of contacts listed in those no foes. Next slide, please. So uh, I also want to make you aware of the um, SBIR contract solicitation, right? So one, in addition to the grant funding mechanism, uh, the program also has SBIR contract solicitations. And this is a little different from the grant mechanism. And what I mean by that, it's since it is a contractual agreement, um, there are deliverables that have to be met. Um, please note that um, the SBIR contract solicitation is actually out now and the proposals are due on November 14th. Um, and also a point to note is that not all institutes participate in the SBIR contract mechanism, but I believe NCATS, NHLBI, NCI, and NIA participate in it. And in fact, um, you know, I would strongly encourage you to please, again, check out the website and reach out to the uh, point of contacts. Next slide, please. So um, in this slide, you know, I just wanted to get you, give you a sense of the uh, timeline that is involved in this funding mechanism, right? Um, so once you put in your application, the center, for, the division for division of receipt and referral at the Center for Scientific Review assigns your application to a study section, and peer review happens. So let's pick actually, for instance, uh, let's pick the September fifth deadline, right? So applications are due on September fifth. The peer review happens sometime in um, you know October November time frame, and then a second level of review actually happens happens at the institute level. Um, and this is called a uh, council meeting. And at NCATS, this typically happens in January. And by the time a notice of award is um, sent out by the grants management office to our um, awardees, it, it is already, you know, it, it, it's probably in late March or April, uh, early April. So as you can tell, um, it takes anywhere from six to eight months from the time of application to when you will get to know of a decision on it. And this is because a number of institutes, divisions, and offices work towards this, right? So nobody likes the waiting game, but I would ask that you keep the benefits of applying to the small business program, uh, like the non-dilutive one that I mentioned earlier, and do consider applying to it. Let's go to the next slide. Next one more, please. Yeah. Um, so I've applied. Uh, if you have applied to the um, NIH uh, grant, um, uh, you are probably familiar with a number of these review criteria. However, given that it is a small business application, our reviewers will look for the commercialization commercialization potential of your technology or product. So just wanted to flag that for your reference. Next slide, please. So for our first timers, uh, note that all applications uh, will be received only electronically, and there are specific registrations that needs to be completed prior to submitting the applications. And these registrations have to be done in a certain order, um, and each one could take anywhere from um, you know up to about two weeks. So the time to have all these registrations in place in itself would take you about a month or two. So we strongly encourage you to start with these registrations really early on um, if you are looking to apply to the SBIR program, S SBIR and STTR program. Let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, just wanted to share uh, on behalf of my colleagues here um, some tips for our applicants. And the first and foremost advice um, is for you to read the funding announcement carefully. Uh, and please reach out to program officers um, prior to submitting an application to make sure that your proposed work is a good fit for the institute. Uh, we are here to help you out. And at the very least, you know, if, if we don't think it's a good fit for our institute, we would be more than happy to connect you with our colleagues from the other ICs uh, whom we might think would be more interested in your application. Then there are also some handy dandy tools that we have, like the NIH reporter tool to learn about projects, 
um, that are funded by the ICs at the NIH. And, um, you know, you can see if uh, similar, you know, something similar to your work has been uh, funded or applied to a specific institute. And I do also want to let you know at this point that we have um, links to some of uh, the sample applications uh, that have been funded by other institutes on our webpage um, that the applicants have graciously, uh, graciously let NIH, NIH um, share to benefit applicants. So please go um, check out those sample applications just to get a sense of how high the bar is and what that rigor, rigor is like, if, especially if you're, a, if you're first time applying to the program. And please submit um, applications early, right? Um, don't wait for 4.49, uh, 4.59, sorry, p.m. Um, on uh, September 5th to hit the submit button just to find out that there is a glitch. Uh, I've had um, numerous last minute panicky emails saying something has gone wrong and they're not able to submit the application. So please, um, you know, we strongly encourage you to submit uh, the applications early on just to, you know, avoid these last minute tense situations. And before I move on to the next slide, I do want to reiterate that it is very important that you talk to program and make sure that your application is of interest to the Institute, right? Um, so with that, uh, let's go to the next slide. So now, um, so some of the, um, you know, with this one, I just wanted to flag um, we, we do get a number of questions uh, from potential applicants, right? Um, so I just wanted to touch upon a few here. Um, so first of all, um, you know, uh, we, uh, people, you know, applicants reach out to us and ask us, hey, does the PI have to have an MD or a PhD? And the short answer is no. Um, but that said, if you're proposing a work that is that requires a PhD level of exper expertise and experience, then yes, of course, it's recommended that one of your team members brings in that qualification. Um, so again, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip through the slide and then go past to the next one, please. But please take a look at it. And if you have any questions, reach out to me. Okay, in my earlier slide, I did say that it takes about six to nine, eight months or even nine months to hear a decision on your application. And, you know, if your application is selected to move forward and, and you know, funding is um, an award, uh, notice of award is sent, then that's great. Um, but the other side to this is, you know, um, you get a rejection and we do understand, trust me, uh, we do understand that, uh, you know, this can be a painful process, but what I would recommend is that you take the summary statement and uh, comments noted by the reviewers in your summary statement as a roadmap to put in a stronger application the next time around. And it is not uncommon to, for us to see that new applicants or first time applicants um, usually are not successful at the first attempt. However, when they address the criticism or the weaknesses noted by the reviewers in the summary statement, excuse me, summary statement and put in a resubmission, their chances are much higher um, because the review team will actually look for if the critics have been addressed or not. Also, it's a good idea to talk to your program, of, uh, program officer to brainstorm ideas for your resubmission. Um, next slide, please. So now that I, um, now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about some resources that are available to small business entrepreneurs. Next slide, please. So there are a number of resources that are available to both our applicants and awardees. Uh, while I will be talking about the commercialization readiness pilot program in just a minute, my colleagues from the other ICs will be speaking of a few other of these resources. So please uh, stay tuned for that. So now going on to the commercialization readiness pilot program, right? This is a program for those, for awardees. Um, with the uh, NI, you know, SBIRR, STTR phase two or phase two B contracts or uh, grant awardees from any of the participating institutes or, uh, um, or centers. CRP provides um, additional technical assistance and late stage research and development support um, that is not typically covered within the small business awards to help products get to the market. So for a list of technical assistance and late stage research development activities covered within the CRP program and you know, get to know about the budget uh, limits and the participating ICs information, please refer to the um, funding announcement. 
Also, I want to let you know um, that NCAT's budget does not allow us to support clinical trials. So we are participating only in the uh, CRP uh, that does not allow uh, clinical trials. Next, let's go to the next slide, please. So um, with NCATS, um, within NCATS, we have other resources that are available to not just our small business entrepreneurs, but also to academics um, and that they can leverage to help them get to a point where they can be um, successful, like say, for instance, filing, filing an IND. So the slide here lists some of the expertise of our NCATS therapeutic team has to offer. Um, let's go to the next slide. And the two programs, so towards this, there are actually two programs, um, the Bridging Interventional Development GAPS program and the Therapeutics for Rare and Neglected Diseases that small business entrepreneurs and academics can leverage to cross the value of death. So you can enter the Bridges program after identifying a clinical candidate and our team will do the gap analysis and provide you support to get to, you know, say successfully file an IND. Let's go to the next slide, please. So the trends is very similar uh, to the Bridges program, but you can enter at any stage of the preclinical development. Um, the only requirement is that you must be working with an FDA defined orphan disease or the World Health Organization designated neglected tropical diseases. Please note that both these programs are currently accepting applications. And if you're interested, please reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to connect you with the right folks in these two programs. Next slide, please. Um, here, I just wanted to, uh, sh um, you know, uh, just show you some of the ways that you can stay connected with NCATS. Uh, we would be very happy if you sign up to our listserv so that you can stay up to date on funding opportunities and resources that are available to you. And always, please uh, feel free to send us an email. Happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you to talk about the appropriate appropriateness of your proposal to NCATS. And like I said earlier, I'll be happy to refer you to my colleagues at the other ICs if I think that they would be more interested in your proposed work. Um, can we go to the next slide? So um, so before I hand over the virtual mic to um, my colleague, Stephanie da Dr. Stephanie Davis at NHLBI, I just wanted to, um, you know, share a, a few words about NIMHD, which is the National Institute of Minority Health Disparities. Um, I, I do want to say that Dr. Michael Benias, who is um, in charge of the small business program at NIMHD, is not able to join us today, but we are happy to share a few slides with you um, regarding the program interests from his institute. And I believe this deck is going to be made available to all, all attendees. So please um, go over this information on NIMHD's small business program and reach out to Dr. Benyas if you need more information or have any questions for him. With that, I pass the baton to my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Davis from NHLBI. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Mina. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Davis, and I am the Small Business Program Coordinator at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And it is lovely to be with you all here today. Next slide, please. So as our name would suggest, the NHLBI Small Business Program is very interested in funding innovative and commercially promising products to prevent, treat, and diagnose heart, lung, blood, and sleep-related diseases. There is one very minor caveat, although we cover a very wide range of conditions. If you are interested in either lung or blood cancers, you're going to want to talk to my good friend and colleague, Dr. Sturge Regmi at the National Cancer Institute. But anything else is likely going to fall in our mission space. And we fund a pretty wide variety of technologies as shown by this pie chart here. So um, we fund approximately 328 active projects we have about 33% of our portfolio consists of therapeutics, which includes both small molecule drugs, peptides, monoclonal antibodies, other biologics. And we are also a very device heavy institute. So about 36% of our portfolio consists of supportive devices, which include both surgical and therapeutic devices. We have about 7% of our portfolio consists of monitoring devices, about 5% in vitro diagnostics, 5% imaging devices. We have a growing 
portion of our portfolio dedicated to softwares, apps, and digital health technologies, and then the remainder goes to research tools. But just keep in mind that most of the applications we get are going to be through those omnibus NOFOs. So this breakdown will change from year to year depending on what meritorious applications we receive. Next slide, please. So the small business program at the NHLBI is, is housed within the NHLBI Innovation and Commercialization Office, also known as the IMC. So in addition to providing monetary support and um, supplements for training programs, which are shown via the red bars on this graphic, we also provide very important non-monetary resources, services, and activities. And the goal of providing both of these types of support is to help advance companies and researchers who are developing promising technologies for diseases within our mission space to support them all the way from their basic and early stage translational research, all the way up to, the, to when their technologies are adopted by both patients and providers. So, um, you know, we participate in several training programs, including ICORT NIH, which I believe NCI is going to be covering. We also participate in the Commercialization Readiness Pilot Program, which Mina mentioned. Um, we offer other training mechanisms through the uh, uh, the C3I program, which provides training opportunities for medical device innovators. And we also provide competing renewal phase 2B awards, which I'm going to talk about in a few slides. Next slide, please. So here is a table of some of the targeted funding opportunities and notices of special interest that the NHLBI participates in. As I mentioned before, most of the applications we get are going to be through one of those omnibus NOFOs, but we do have several funding opportunities that have special review and set aside funds that I wanted to highlight within the next few slides. Next slide, please. So Mina referenced this earlier in her presentation. Um, and one of these RFAs that we offer is one that is a joint program with NCATS. But we have two phase 2B RFAs that are available to companies that have previously been awarded a phase 2 grant or contract, and they need to have additional funding to help meet their regulatory milestones, uh, connect with investors and strategic partners, and commercialize their technologies. So the two programs we have are called the Bridge and the Small Market Program. These both offer up to $3 million in total costs over three years. And the Bridge Program funds all technologies that could potentially fall within the NHLBI mission space, while the Small Market Program is specifically designed for technologies that address rare diseases and or pediatric indications, which is part of the reason why NCATS partners with us on that RFA, because they have a very strong rare disease interest. So although the funding is the same for both of these RFAs, there is a different matching fund expectation for both. So as a condition of award, we do expect our bridge award applicants to bring in a one-to-one -one match of private funds. So what that means is if they get a $3 million award, we expect them to bring in $3 million in matching funds. The small market awardees do have a matching requirement, but it is lower. So if a small market awardee gets a $3 million grant, we're expecting them to bring in $1 million in matching funds. So the next due date for our phase 2B RFAs is going to be February 28, 2024. You do not have to have gotten your phase 2 award from the NHLBI to be eligible. You could have gotten your phase 2 award from another institute, even another agency. As long as your technology requires regulatory approval and it falls within our mission space, we are interested in having your submission. So please feel free to reach out if you'd like to learn more about our phase 2B program. Next slide, please. So another RFA that I wanted to highlight is the Innovations for Healthy Living Small Business RFA. So this is an RFA that is led by our friends at the National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities. So the focus of this RFA is to provide funding to innovators that are developing technologies, tools, and devices for uh, decreasing health disparities in historically underserved, low resource and health disparity communities. So we are interested in pretty much any sort of technology that can help alleviate health disparities in heart, lung, blood and sleep patients. So this uh, has a different due date than the omnibus. It's going to be September 6, 2023. 
But I strongly recommend anybody who is developing a device or a software program or something that relates to a heart, lung, blood, or sleep health disparity to apply through this RFA. Next slide, please. Another RFA that I wanted to highlight that has its own pool of money is going to be the HEAL RFA. So this RFA is a part of the Helping End Addiction Long-Term Program. And the goal of both the SBIR and SPTR RFAs are to fund the development of new non-addictive therapeutics and pain management strategies. So as you can imagine, the NHLBI is interested in new therapeutics that are non-addictive and pain management strategies for patients who have heart, lung, blood, or sleep conditions. So the next due date for this one is actually going to be um, it's scheduled for September 4th, but since September 4th falls on Labor Day, it will actually be September 5th. So this is another funding opportunity where if you have a technology that falls within the scope of this RFA, I would strongly recommend applying. Next slide, please. So the NHLBI, as well as all of the other institutes that participate in the small business program, provide a limited allowance for awardees to be able to support activities that relate to technical and business assistance, also known as TABA activities. So some of the activities that are supported by TABA funds can include, but are not limited to, IP protection, market research, development of regulatory and manufacturing plans, assistance with product sales, or access to technical and business databases. So awardees have two have a couple, couple of options for their TABA um, support. They can either request they can request the support directly in their application under S section F, other direct costs. And so phase one applicants can request up to 6.5K per year for their project. Phase two applicants can request up to $50,000 for their project. Uh, some institutes allow companies to request these after the fact via an admin supplement. So um, it's important to check out notice OD21062 to show to see which institutes and centers allow this, because some of them do, but others do not. And then finally, the NIH Small Business Entrepreneurial Education and Development, or seed office, provides centralized programs that are available to both phase one and phase two grantees. And these are the needs assessment program and the consulting services. So companies that have not requested TABA in their application or through an administrative supplement can take advantage of these programs. But I strongly recommend if you are applying to request it in your application, uh, even if you don't really know what you're going to be using it for at, when you apply, that information can be provided during just in time. But it is easiest to get those TABA funds if you request them at the time of the application. Next slide, please. So in the Innovation and Commercialization Office, as I mentioned, we provide both monetary support and non-monetary support. So I have a really wonderful team of entrepreneurs and residents who I get to work with, and they are here to not only provide their subject matter expertise to various projects, but they are also there to provide pitch coaching services and provide one-on-one -on -one consults with our companies. And these services do not just, aren't just limited to small business grantees, they can also provide their expertise on product commercialization for uh, teams and investigators who are receiving funding through other mechanisms of support. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I like to do in, in uh, outreach presentations is I always love to highlight companies that are located within the geographical area of the partner in question. So I wanted to highlight just a few companies that are based in Wisconsin. So the first company that I wanted to highlight is called Cellular Logistics. So this is a spin out company from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. So they are developing a therapeutic biomaterial called CFX that promotes cardiac regeneration after acute myocardial infarction. So they have gotten two SBIR phase one awards from the NHLBI. And they recently won an $850,000 SBIR grant, advanced grant from the state of Wisconsin. So I've included a picture of Dr. Schmuck, who uh, is a faculty member at UW-Madison, as well as the co-founder and CSO of Cellular Logistics. Next slide, please. Another company that I wanted to highlight is a spin out from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee and the Milwaukee Institute for Drug Discovery. 
So this company was founded by Dr. Doug Stafford, um, and it's called Pantherix. So they are developing a GABA-A receptor agonist called PI301 for the treatment of asthma. So they have been awarded phase one awards from the NHLBI, and they have also received uh, the grand prize for the 2022 Milwaukee Tech Week Healthcare Innovation Pitch Event Grand Prize. Next slide, please. And finally, I wanted to highlight our last company. This one is um, our later stage company that I wanted to highlight, uh, In Vivo Sciences, which, which is a precision medicine focused company based in Madison. So they are developing both therapeutics and tools to improve drug screening um, that can help accelerate the development of therapeutics for heart failure. Um, so one of their um, signature products is an IPSC derived micro heart tissue called New Heart. So they have been both awarded SBIR phase one and two awards from a, an HLBI, and they've also received a phase one award from the National Institute on Aging. And in 2022, they were selected as the Innovation Challenge winner for the Redefining Early Stage Investment Conference. And there is the co-founder CEO, Isla Anak, with their technology. Next slide, please. So one funding opportunity that is not small business, but I wanted to highlight for this presentation uh, is the Catalyze program. So Catalyze is very similar to the small business program in that it funds technology development, but it is open to academic investigators and nonprofit institutions as well. So you do not have a, have a company to apply for Catalyze. So there are several RFAs that make up the Catalyze funding opportunities, and they are grouped by different technology types. So the next application deadline for Catalyze is going to be November 21st, 2023. But if you do not yet have a company and you're interested in getting some early stage funding to develop your technology, I would strongly recommend looking into some of these RFAs. Next slide, please. And so I strongly recommend to follow us on Twitter or X as it's now called at NHLBI underscore SBIR if you'd like to get updates on what's going on with our small business program and the INC. If you need to email us, you can reach us at nhlbi underscore sbir at mail.nih.gov. And please feel free to scan the QR codes if you'd like to visit our website or sign up for our monthly newsletter. And that concludes my session. I'm going to be turning it over to my colleague, Dr. Josh Hooks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, really glad to be here. Again, my name is Joshua Hooks. I'm a program officer in the Office of Strategic Extramural Programs at the National Institute on Aging. Next slide, please. So uh, as my colleagues have gone over in a lot of detail, the, all of every uh, institute at NIH provides small business funding to kind of spur innovation within their, their field. NIA is now the third largest institute and provides roughly $150 million annually uh, to nonprofit and uh, nonprofit businesses uh, to, and to fund their innovation. Next slide, please. Um, Unlike National Heart, Lung, and Blood or National Cancer Institute, aging is, is a pretty broad term. And so we are willing to fund a variety of different disease indications in, in, this, in, in how they interact with aging. Uh, specifically, uh, by congressional mandate, a large portion of our budget uh, is dedicated to funding innovations around Alzheimer's disease and related dementias uh, and broadly age-related changes in brain function. Um, but outside of that, we're also interested in technologies to improve aging in place and uh, independence in aging, age-related diseases and conditions, and research tools in order to conduct aging research. Um, and so these can be a variety of kind of companion diagnostics, uh, bioinformatic, public health informatics, and other data science technologies, cell and gene therapies, so on and so forth. Uh, the chart on the right shows just kind of our current funding by portfolio classification. You can see roughly 30% of our budget goes to therapeutics, um, but one of the fastest growing segments is on digital and mobile health. And this chart on the right is kind of just an indication of what is currently funded, not necessarily an indication of priorities. We're open to meritorious applications in all technologies. Next slide, please. Um, so as you've heard now, NIH's funding is broken down into various phases, the phase one being primarily focused on discovery and feasibility, 
Uh, I bring up this slide primarily just to show NIA specific uh, funding caps. So for a phase one award, uh, they're typically up to one year in length and will award 400,000 for what we consider general aging projects. That's pretty much everything other than projects related to Alzheimer's disease and dementia and up to 500,000 for projects that do address Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And this stage again is to kind of establish the technical merit and feasibility of your approach. Phase two funding is typically up to two years in length. Uh, the budget goes up to 2.25 million for general aging projects and 2.5 million for Alzheimer's disease and dementia related projects. Uh, for this phase, you will need to have a commercialization plan to really show where your technology fits in the market. And this is for somewhat more advanced research and development efforts. In addition to those two phases, NIA participates in fast track awards, so combining both your phase one and phase two proposals into one application, uh, direct to phase two for SBIR applications. Um, NIA participates in the commercialization readiness pilot, uh, so this is a, a unique kind of phase to be like program uh, where you can, in addition to funding the late stage research and development, you can also request for those fundings to be used for technical assistance activities, things such as uh, developing a commercialization plan, manufacturing plan, scaling up your technology. And that award is up to 3.94 million and you have to have had an active phase two award and or have or have had recently an active phase two award. And then there's also the phase two B award for continuing research efforts on a phase two award. And that's up to 3 million they can spread out over three years. Next slide, please. Um, so again, uh, as, as we've outlined, there's the omnibus solicitation. Again, NIA treats that as kind of our general aging funding and then targeted solicitations of which NIA participates in a variety. Uh, next slide. Again, uh, the omnibus is kind of the general aging projects, depending on your kind of employment and the, the terms of your project, you can apply either through the SBIR or STTR mechanisms. And we do participate in clinical trials. So you know, make sure that you apply to the correct uh, notice of funding so that you apply to the one that allows for clinical trials if you need a clinical trial or to the one that does not allow clinical trials if you are not uh, using human participation. Um, and then our primary targeted funding opportunity is that opportunity in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias that has the slightly higher budget caps because that is a high priority area for us. Um, but we also are signed on to a lot of the other funding opportunities that have been outlined today, including the HEAL initiative for pain management techniques for chronic conditions and the uh, innovations for healthy living for uh, technologies on the intersection of uh, health disparities and aging research or aging innovation. Um, we also have put out a notice of special special interests for digital technologies for early detection, characterization, and monitoring of senescence-related changes. So if you're researching in that space, we're really interested in providing funding for those technologies. Next slide. So again, NIA participates in a lot of the additional kind of entrepreneurial training programs that have been outlined by my colleagues at NCATS and NHLB. NHLBI, um, but I just wanted to highlight a few of those in green to go into a little bit more detail, but please reach out for questions about any of these other support programs that we provide to our awardees and to potential applicants. Next slide. So the first program I wanted to talk to, talk about is the READY program or the Research and Entrepreneurial Development Immersion Program. It is a series of funding opportunities aimed at providing entrepreneurial training that is within the NIA mission space and kind of allowing trainees to acquire additional non-academic skills. So we take a really broad definition of entrepreneurship and are interested in providing early stage researchers, this can be graduate students, postdocs, and junior faculty, depending on the award, um, skill sets in bioentrepreneurship, IP, drug discovery, regulatory affairs, and even things that might not be traditionally considered entrepreneurship like science communication and science policy or on consulting career pathways, recognizing that more and more researchers are moving into fields outside of academic research. Uh, next slide. The four primary awards that are currently encompassed under this READY umbrella are the READY SBIR STTR awards, the READY R25 award, and the READY K01 award. They are all currently active and are accepting applications uh, throughout mid to late October. So the READY 
uh, starting with the Ready R25, this is an entrepreneurial educational uh, award. So it's to provide funding for a institute, nonprofit or for-profit business to provide educational programs for graduate students and or postdocs uh, around how to pursue entrepreneurship, uh, IP and all those topics that I outlined previously. And then the Ready K01 Award, I think of this as for postdocs or early stage faculty that are interested in, in gaining those skill sets, but still want to maintain uh, their primary responsibilities within a kind of academic research lab, typically. And this would allow them to uh, this would provide salary in addition to some extra funding to do workshops and trainings and attend conferences in those topics um, outside of academic research. Um, next slide. The two awards that I thought would be most relevant to this audience are the Ready SBIR and Ready STTR awards. So I'll spend a little bit more time on, on those mechanisms. These are novel SBIR STTR mechanisms for which the PI must be within 10 years of their terminal research degree. This can be a uh, PhD, an MD, or a science-focused master's degree. Um, the applicant can have never cannot have successfully competed for a NIH small business or major research grant, such as an R01. Uh, it requires the PI to identify a dedicated entrepreneurial mentor and to create a career development plan that really outlines, in addition to being the PI for an SBIR project, how they will use some of the funding on that award to attend trainings, uh, go to conferences, and uh, receive certifications in the entrepreneurial space, realizing that they're really early to this entrepreneurial uh, to entrepreneurship and would need some additional training and career development. And please reach out for any additional questions. Um, those awards have a 500,000 cap for a phase one award. You can also apply for a fast track award for up to 2.5 million. Next slide, please. Another unique program at the National Institute on Aging is our Startup Challenge and Accelerator program, of which we're in our second year of running this program. Uh, its focus is fostering entrepreneurial diversity. Um, it addresses challenges faced by diverse innovators and it, to kind of provide additional training for innovations impacting health disparities. Um, it is set up as a roughly five month entrepreneurial boot camp. Um, where we have additional pieces of mentorship and a cash prize that the participants will compete for. Next slide. Okay. So a major component, again, is this in-depth entrepreneurial training. We cover a, a wide variety of topics. We really see this as, a, as an accelerator program to cover uh, both how to successfully compete for SBIR funding, but in addition, how to conduct customer discovery, how to innovate for health equity, navigating entrepreneurship as a diverse founder, go to market strategies, IP, so on and so forth. And another great piece of this program is the fact that it will match these early stage founders with one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And those mentors have really agreed to tap the participants into their networks to really help them flesh out their ideas and uh, figure out how to best bring them to market. Next slide. And I just wanted to quickly highlight our 2022 cohort. So we are currently running the 2023 cohort, but the 2022 cohort was our founding cohort. They were great. You can see here just the, the full diversity of research topics that the cohort was addressing um, and happy to talk to anyone who might be interested in potential future iterations of this program. Next slide. Finally, I wanted to outline the NIH Applicant Assistance Program. Uh, this is a program that uh, several institutes, but not all institutes at NIH have participated in. Um, but all of the institutes that are presenting here are signed on to this Applicant Assistance Program. You can see the full list at the top of this slide. It provides 10 weeks of application preparation assistance. Um, so it helps with phase one preparation, support, and review of the materials that you will ultimately submit. Uh, to help you work through your specific aims page and giving additional review and advice for that, in addition to just broad coaching. Um, this is not a grant writing program, so the if you get accepted into this program, no one is going to write the grant for you, but they really kind of work with you to help make as strong of a proposal as possible. They don't develop your research plan, they simply give advice um, and they help work with you. Uh, they help talk you through some of the uh, registration steps, but you have to ultimately register your small business. Next slide. 
And just a little bit more information. To be eligible, you have to have never received a small business grant or at least not in the last 10 years. Uh, there's a strong interest in applicants who are currently underrepresented in biosciences and, and life science entrepreneurship, including women-owned small businesses, minority-owned small businesses, and small businesses operating in idea states or underrepresented states. They're currently accepting applications until September 12th. And if you get accepted through this application, it will be to prepare you for the January 5th submission on um, the omnibus of solicitation. And again, please reach out with any questions. Next slide. Um, just wanted to emphasize that we're here um, as a resource to all potential applicants. The best, one of the best first steps you can take is simply sending me or one of my colleagues an email just to get a sense of if your technology is a good fit and what I institute it might be a good fit for. And please reach out. We're we're here to help. And um, if you go to the next slide, I have our email address here uh, for any questions. And with that, I will turn things over to my colleague Saroj Regni. Thank you very much, Dr. Hooks. Uh, my name is Saroz Regmi, and I'm one of the program directors at the NCI SBR Development Center. Uh, first of all, I'd really like to thank all the organizers for this great opportunity to talk about the NCI's SBIR program. These virtual outreach events are great. Uh, they're fantastic. And I do want to highlight today uh, the fact that we program officers are really approachable. We're federal employees, and our job is to demystify the SBR SCTR application process for you. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, yeah, reach out to us via email. We're more than happy to schedule one-on-one -on -one if your technology aligns with our institute and talk to you. So definitely think of us uh, as your resource in your SBIR journey, along with your state-specific resources, which uh, Wisconsin does a fantastic job of. Um, so I just wanted to start with that. So <clears throat> uh, in terms of the NCI's SBIR-funded portfolio, we're pretty broad in our coverage of cancer-specific technologies. We fund uh, small molecules, uh, cancer biology research tool, imaging devices, uh, almost anything and everything to do with cancer. And we have we have the largest SBR budget within the NIH. Uh, so for fiscal year 2023, we had a budget of $203 million um, for uh, startups um, involved in oncology specific areas. Next slide, please. So this was mentioned previously as well. So the SBIR, SCTR program are uh, organized into three different phases. Uh, there's a phase one, which is a proof of concept work, which affords up to $400,000 uh, at the NCI for six to 12 months of work. Uh, once you go through a phase one for furthering your research and development, uh, once you have a commercialization plan and you've thought about that commercialization piece, you can apply for what is called a phase two. Uh, this is a $2 million award at the NCI for two years. Uh, definitely check out each and every in, in institute and what their budget limits are. They, they do change depending on the institute. Uh, so there are some subtle, uh, subtle differences uh, to the budget amount. <clears throat> now, if you've already done some of the, uh, you know, groundwork, if you've already done some of the preliminary work, and if you want to come in directly at phase two, you can do that as well. And that is what we call a directive phase two. That is for that. That is again that two million dollar award. And if you wanted to combine both a phase one and a phase two, get a sort of a twofer uh, application where you really have good milestones that you know you're going to achieve at the end of your year one. Um, then you can definitely consider what is called a fast track that combines a phase one with a phase two. At the end of a phase one, there's a go, no go decision with your program officer. And that's a $2.4 million award with uh, $400,000 for phase one and $2 million for that phase two part of your project. At the National Cancer Institute, we also have what is called a bridge award. Uh, this is to help you cross the valley of death. And if you're really looking into regulatory framework, looking into validation of technology and cl clinical translation, this is a great program for you. This provides follow-on funding for SBIR phase two awardees from any of the federal agencies, provided that you're working in the space of oncology. The expectation is that you will secure substantial third-party investor funds. This is a $4.5 million award for over two to three years. So the goal is that you bring in at least $4.5 million from different investor sources, from third party and NCI will provide you $4.5 million. Unlike some of the other federal agencies, NCI and NIH does not have a phase three program. We will not buy the product. We do not think of ourselves as a customer for that phase two. So we, we hope that you graduate from the program and you are able to commercialize and utilize your non-SBR SCTR funds for, for, that, for that phase three. 
Next slide, yes. So right off the bat, as I mentioned, definitely check out every institute and their budget limits. Uh, at the National Cancer Institute, we have a waiver wherein we can allow $400,000, up to $400,000 total cost, including both direct and indirect costs uh, for your phase one work. For your phase two, you can request up to $2 million. Like I said, again, this is very institute specific, so definitely check out um, each institute and their rules when it comes to waiver topics. Um, if you go to the next slide, you will see that the waiver topic coverage for NCI is pretty exhaustive and broad. Uh, so if you're working in the realm of therapeutics, if you're working in in vitro and in vivo diagnostics, if you're working with imaging modalities and technologies, devices for cancer therapy, agents for cancer prevention, and if you're also uh, looking at developing digital health tools or technologies, uh, low cost technologies for low resource settings and cancer global health, you will qualify for that waiver topic. You will be able to request $400,000 for that phase one and $2 million for that phase two. So this is this I think is a really interesting graph that I really like to use uh, just to show you, tell you the story about the SBRSATR program. So basically what we found out in fiscal year 2021, when we looked at all of our portfolio, when we looked at success rate is that we found out that original submission. So if it's if it's an application that was submitted the first time around, the success rate was, was around seven to 8%. And if the application had been resubmitted, what we call an A1, we found out that the success rate had gone up now to up to 20%. And our overall success rate was around 10%. And so what this graph really tells you is that there are definitely merits to resubmitting. So it's really a good idea to think about that um, in it, submitting that initial application early on, getting that reviewer feedback, and then being prepared to resubmit. Resubmission is really helpful because your odds of success really tend to improve. And so if you have not been successful the first time around, I definitely urge you to think about resubmission. I definitely cannot highlight enough the fact that you should come talk to us. We're, 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 we're a resource for you, and we're always available to talk to you about your resubmission process as well. Next slide. So let me just uh, quickly talk about some of the funding opportunities through the NCI. So this is an exhaustive list of all the funding opportunities. We participate in the omnibus solicitation, both the SPR and SCTR. We do fund clinical trials. Um, and we also have a couple of notice of special interest around low resource settings, as well as uh, liquid biopsy assay validation. Uh, there are also other, a uh, couple of other awards that I'd like to quickly go over in the next couple of minutes. Next slide. So one thing that we were really interested in at the NCI was a small business transition grant. So we're thinking about an, an entrepreneurial training path for graduate students and postdocs that are thinking about a career in entrepreneurship. So for the aficionados who are familiar with the K99R00 pathway, wherein the postdoc remains at the educational institution for a number of years before they transition uh, to a, a faculty position at that institution, we wanted to create something similar. And so we wanted to create that entrepreneurial path for trainees. And so this is the general idea behind the small business transition grants. Our goal is that postdocs or graduating students that are thinking about entrepreneurship can spin out their technologies and also be empowered to do so uh, by this grant. Next slide. So this is a really unique mechanism, um, given the fact that at a phase one, it is an STTR. We believe that the STTR at a phase one affords extra flexibility for the individual, the PI, who is a postdoc or a graduating PhD student, to continue working on their innovation while remaining at the educational institution. Um, so majority of the time, the PI will be a postdoc. They can be graduating PhD students. They can be folks with a master's degree. Uh, and what we require for this is two mentors. Um, there is a mentoring plan that is required. They are required to have a technical mentor who is most likely their research uh, research mentor. Um, and they're also required to have a business mentor who can uh, guide them through the, the, the business path pathway and also provide them um, with advice as needed. So we'll also pay for them to participate in the i program, which is a customer discovery program at the um, NIH. And then I'll, I'm happy to talk about that uh, in a couple of slides. And so you're at a phase one STTR and once the technology is ready to transition into a small business, uh, once all the milestones have been met, all the IP agreement is in place, then the phase two part of that award begins. And the the expectation now is that the trainee, the PI, the postdoc, 
or a graduate student moves to the small business as, as a PI. So the PI is not transferable. It's going to be the same individual. The mentoring is, is continuing. Um, and now they're, they're really working on that innovation. Small pivots are allowed, but the goal is that, you know, what they started with early on, they will keep working on and commercialize their product. Uh, so, yeah, so that, that's the award. The, the application recently, uh, the NOFO recently expired, but we hope to launch it again in, in, in a couple, uh, in, in a year. The other award that I'd like to talk to you about is a concept award. So this is a really cool mechanism to fund disruptive technologies to address rare and pediatric cancer. The application process is very different. We utilize the contract mechanism. So it's a short application around 20 pages versus your traditional SBR, SCTRs that require more than 50 pages. Uh, we, we do encourage you to submit uh, a white paper wherein you submit a short idea about your technology. We will have an internal review where we uh, we will provide you feedback and then we will, we will request that you submit a full application. Uh, a lot of focus is on innovation. Uh, around 40% of the review criteria will be on innovation, how innovative, how disruptive the technology is. Um, and we're looking to fund experiments really early so that we can de-risk early stage technology. So these are gonna be high risk, high reward kind of approaches that we're really interested in. We aim to make awards really rapidly within six months. And you'll also expect that the awardees enroll in i programs so that they can learn about customer discovery. Um, so this also expired recently in, in August 21st. So uh, the next solicitation hopefully will come out next year. The, the other thing that I'd like to mention is I think we've talked quite a bit about contract topics. Um, so contract topics are really great. If you have a if you have an innovation that is that aligns really well with contract topic, then I really encourage you to think about it and submit a contract uh, so a contract application. Uh, NCI is one of the heavy heaviest users of contract topics. Uh, each year these topics change, and this year we have around eleven topics uh, to to be included in the solicitation. I believe the deadline will be sometime in November, um, and so. They're pretty diverse um, in terms of the subject area encompassing all aspects, aspects of con uh, cancer, but they are they are pretty narrow in their focus. So, for example, ultra flash dose uh, rate, flash radiation technology for detecting tumor derived cell clusters, cancer prevention and treatment, clinical trial tools for recruitment and retention of diverse populations and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, really things that we want to seed uh, at the SBR Center so that uh, there will be future um, commercializing uh, commercialized innovations out there. Uh, next slide. Uh, I talked a little bit about the Bridge Award. So again, just to reiterate, whether you've gone through a SBIR phase to either through NCI or NIH or any of the federal agencies, if you have a technology that aligns well with the mission of the National Cancer Institute, uh, definitely think about submitting an application. This again is a once a year funding opportunity that just expired. So the next receipt date will hopefully come out next year. The goal here is to really accelerate commercialization and incentivize partnership. We expect that um, at least one-to-one -one match uh, and we provide $4.5 million, not $4 million in additional funding over a span of two to three years. Next slide. So I just wanted to highlight one of the recent success stories. I think the biggest success story of NCI actually is, is a company called Illumina, which I'm sure all of you have heard of. Uh, but a recent success story is this company called Immunomedics. Uh, they developed an antibody drug conjugate uh, directed against a protein called TROP2, which is a cell surface protein expressed in many solid cancers. And so this um, antibody drug conjugate was conjugated with a, a topoisomerase inhibitor for the aficionados. And the goal was to really, uh, you know, home this drug and, and, and uh, treat triple negative breast cancer. So in 2012, Immunomedics received their SBIR award and they used it to fund the first in human trial of Trodelvi. In 2020, they received FDA approval. And in September of 2020, they were actually acquired by Gilead for $21 billion. So you really can start small with your SBIR and you can really take it to market. So definitely think about, think about that piece as well. Next slide. Uh, and I think I've, I've said this a lot of times, but I cannot highlight this enough. Definitely reach out to a program director. Um, we're really here to help you out with your SBIR journey. If you have any questions, uh, be sure to email. If you have an idea you'd like to discuss, if you'd like to discuss FIT, if you are unsure about which particular funding opportunity is a, is a good way, uh, reach out to one of us. We're, we're more than happy to have a one-on-one -on -one with you. We're more than happy to respond to you via email. 
Uh, the only caveat is please don't ask us questions two days before the deadline. We may not have bandwidth in that case. So definitely give us ample time and we're happy to help you out. Next slide. So I'll focus a couple of uh, minutes on talking about some of the um, initiatives that we have at the NCI SBR Development Center. Some of them were uh, mentioned in pretty big, uh, pretty um, in detail through um, from one of, from um, my colleagues at other institutes. Uh, but uh, in the next slide, you'll see a list of different programs. So before phase one, NCI participates in the application assistance program. This was covered really well. Um, we uh, at the NCI we have also have a lot of different programs such as the I Core, uh, which is a customer discovery focused program. The investor initiatives I'll talk a little bit about it. Peer learning webinars uh, that are for everybody. Uh, we also have resources for commercialization workshops. We have executive roundtables. Um, uh, we also have a really good relationship with FDA, so we are able to connect our awardees to regulatory experts at FDA, so that they can ask these uh, important questions early on and get answers. We also have an industry mentoring and assistance program, and we have a women's innovation network. A majority of these programs are once you get the award, unfortunately, uh, but I'm happy to talk about a couple of them. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So i at NIH is, is a really intensive entrepreneurial immersion course. The goal is customer discovery. Uh, you will have to do around 100 interviews in a span of eight weeks. Um, and with each interview, you learn more about your innovation. So it's an experiential learning focus. Uh, this was designed by the NCI SBIR, and now it's managed by the NIH. Uh, there are 24 institutes at NIH and CDC participate, and this is available for phase one awardees. Um, so if you, there's more information on that link um, at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. So the requirement is that uh, SBIR SCTR grantees are uh, can assemble three-member team that will work collaboratively. They need to have a principal investigator. They need a C-level executive with, with decision-making authority, and they also need an industry expert uh, who has some business development expertise so that they can guide them through this customer discovery process. There are instructors that are experienced business savvy uh, that work closely with the project team to help them explore their market and also help them think about the question a little bit. They have domain expertise in the major product areas that comprise the biomedical industry. Um, the NIH will pay up to $55,000 to support entrepreneurial training, mentorship, and collaboration opportunities. Uh, to be eligible, you have to be a if active phase one SPIR or STTR grantee. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have a phase one grant or a contract as well, you are eligible. Um, and the predicate phase one must, be, must have project and budget timeline that are active uh, from application date through the end of i -Corps. Uh, so that's really important. So if you have an award with us, if you're interested in customer discovery, definitely consider applying for the i program at NIH. Next slide. The other valuable resource is the planned webinar series, peer learning and networking webinar series. The goal here is that we will create a pre-recorded panelist presentation on a small uh, on a specific topic area. Uh, the goal is that you will watch that webinar, you will write down your questions, and then you'll attend a real-time panel session where, wherein we'll invite these panelists and there will be a moderated Q&A session to ask the questions. So some of the topics that we've covered are how to write a good specific AIMS page, the video content is available, how to implement a QMS quality management system, uh, what are the first steps for starting a small business. Um, and so all of these contents are available online. So definitely go on our website and have a look at the plan webinar series. This may be really useful as you're thinking about either submitting an application or if you are an awardee. Next slide. The other program that I'd like to highlight the, is Investor Initiatives Program at the NCI. So this is a great program in that if you're a current or recent NCI awardee, you can apply once a year. Uh, we generally get around 80 to 100 applications. Uh, once you submit your short one to two page application, it gets reviewed by pharma and venture partners uh, from J&J, you know, &J, Pfizer, GE, NPM, just to name a few. All of the applications that you submit, um, you will get a constructive feedback from these investors from the space. Um, and the next step is based on these reviews, we will select about 25 to 30 companies. Um, we'll assist them with presentation fees for our conference. Uh, it could be bio, it could be med tech, uh, anything that is relevant. And so we, we will pay for you to go to these conferences and, and present your work and, and we'll support your pitch. Uh, we'll also, uh, provide um, training for pitches. So we'll pitch coach these companies. Uh, there might be 
There might be other mentoring that, uh, programs that might be involved as well. There's also industry mentoring um, that, that will uh, happen for, for these companies. Uh, and sometimes these may result in introductions to investors as well. Uh, we will create a booklet of the companies that have been selected for the year, and they'll be shared via newsletter to all of our investor network. Uh, and when investors request, we're also happy to do direct introductions to our SBIR awardees. So this is a really great program um, as well for our awardees. Next slide, please. So uh, definitely there are a lot of um, events. Uh, I really encourage you to think about um, signing up for our mailing list. You'll be aware of a lot of um, resources and opportunities, funding opportunities that are available through the NCI SBIR Development Center. We also host an SBIR monthly office hour. So if you have a short question, uh, consider signing up for that as well, wherein you'll be able to connect one-on-one -on -one with an NCI SBIR program director. Um, and if you just wanna reach out, I'm more than happy to um, uh, take any e email and take any questions from you as well. Uh, there are upcoming events that are listed. Uh, and once again, definitely think about signing up for our mailing list. Next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate all of the feedback. And it's fantastic to have so many institutes here to share more about the resources and specific program opportunities that are available. Um, I think you know that every institute wants you to be successful because we want new innovative products to come to market. Uh, we appreciate all of your questions. We're going to do a moderated Q&A now. Um, if you do have any other questions, feel free to drop in the chat and um, in the Q&A feature. And I'll also note that um, we want you to fill out the feedback form. We'll include that again in the in the chat links. Uh, but before you sign off, please do fill out that feedback form. So I'm going to go through some general topics, and then uh, we I will call on um, some of the specific institutes. Okay. Um, so generally speaking, um, there are some folks here who are outside of Wisconsin. I just wanted to let you know that all of the Institute that spoke today, the resources are available to the entire nation. Um, it's not one specific state. However, uh, Wisconsin uh, resources and nonprofits that have been presented here today are related to Wisconsin. So I'll just uh, just check in to see if Women in Bio or any others have anything to say about that question. Yeah, the only thing um, I would add is if you go to sbir.gov, there is a page that lists all the support organizations and all of the FAST grant awardees in each state. So many of these uh, organizations like us can only service their state because we are state funded as well. Um, so I would suggest going to sbir.gov, looking for the support organization by state. I think that's how they, I'll try to find the website and put it in the chat, but that is what I would suggest. Look for your state's um, support organization and they'll have the similar programs to us that I went over. Wonderful, thank you. The next question is for NCATS. Does NCATS use a Paylon score and how do you select grants for awards? Great question. Um, well, it actually depends and it varies from cycle, uh, cycle to cycle. Um, so I would say probably, you know, this, we, we have typically funded uh, applications that have scored um, anywhere from 20s to we've gone as high as um, 38, I would say. But again, it just depends on the cycle and the pool of the applications that we receive for that round. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so for NIA, can you share, does the SPR uh, SCTR program phase one at NIA offer an extension over the budget cap of 400 or 500 like other ICs do? And if so, under what conditions? No, so the budget caps outlined are keeping in mind the budget waivers. Um, NIA has a kind of liberal or broad budget waivers to cover most projects. Uh, but be sure to to review those budget waivers, and that's how you qualify for that either four hundred thousand to five hundred thousand budget cap. Thank you. And another question for you related to Ready: um, Can a participant apply for the Ready K O one as a STEM MBA with over eight years experience in biotech and healthcare? No, the individual would need a doctoral degree um, in order to qualify for the Ready K O one. 
Thank you. Uh, so the next question relates to resubmission. Um, and uh, this is open to any one of you who want to start first, but um, how many times can you resubmit an SPR grant? So, I, so you can um, go for it. So I could take that one. So officially, you can only submit an application once. So when you resubmit, it's going to be called an A1 as opposed to an A0, which is a new submission package. If your A1 application package is not scored, you can technically resubmit it, but it has to be formatted as an A0 or a new application package. So you're not allowed to reference your previous submission. Thank you. Yeah, and, I, I will uh, add. Uh, I will add a couple of things. One is that you know, obviously, you're only allowed to resubmit once. But even if you're not successful during a resubmission, definitely think about getting that feedback and submit a new application. You can submit your application multiple times. It's just that the resubmission will allow you to have that one page wherein you're able to, um, you know, address some of the reviewer concern with with, with that with that application. Um, you you also have to resubmit within 37 months, uh, and officially you're al allowed one resubmission within 37 months from the time. Uh, your initial submission. Thank you. And uh, Stephanie, just a follow up on that question. Does resubmission for grants mean that this would be for the next grant cycle or would it be with that current deadline? I just want to understand the timing uh, perspective of resubmission. Yes. So the rule of thumb is that when you submit, when you're submitting two overlapping applications, obviously a resubmission is going to be scientifically overlapping with the initial submission. The rule of thumb is you have to wait until the summary statement from the first submission is back before you could submit the other. So sometimes you are able to, for example, if you submit an application for the September deadline, it's probably going to be reviewed in November. Your summary statement is likely going to be back in December. Once that summary statement is back, you are cleared to submit for the January deadline. However, sometimes, especially if you submit for the January deadline, the summary statement from that January submission does not come back before the April 5th deadline. So the rule of thumb is that if your summary statement is not back yet, you cannot resubmit. Thank you. And a follow-up uh, for Saroj on this very same topic. When submitting a resubmission grant application, is it allowed to change from a phase one submission into a phase two or fast track submission? Yeah, when you do that, it might be better to just submit it as a fresh application. Get that review or feedback, you utilize that and then uh, submit a fresh application. And one more question for you, Saroj. Like the K99, can international postdocs apply for R41 or R42? Or is it only for permanent residents or citizens? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing the question is for the small business transition grant for the the grant that just expired, you have to be a permanent resident or a, or a citizen. For traditional SBR, CTR grants, there's no stipulation for uh, the residency status of, of the PI, as long as the small business concern is primarily owned and operated by U.S.-based individuals, the PI can be an international, provided that they have a valid visa to conduct the work for the duration of the time in the U.S. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for NIA. Um, has NIA considered targeting older researchers um, or is age ever a disqualifier? Age. So age is not a disqualifier. We don't look at the applicant's uh, chronological age in any capacity. Um, there's just, for like the READY program, there is a consideration for kind of early stage in their career um, for some award, for that particular award, but uh, that's just for that ready program. Thank you. So um, who is the first contact that a participant should reach out to assess fit for a company or research focus area uh, for each program or institute? So, there is a, a web page that outlines a point of contact for every institute across NIH. Um, but generally, if you if you send that person in a, an email or if you send any program officer an email, they can help point you in the right direction if they are not the appropriate program officer to discuss your application. There Thank also you. will generally be points of contact in the notice of award at the bottom of that web page as well. 
And a participant is asking, what's the best way to find uh, waiver amounts per institute? I can take that question. So Thank I you. believe the waiver to topics and the amounts are actually included in the program description within the omnibus solicitation. So I would definitely, um, you know, suggest that you refer to the program description again in the funding announcement. Thank you. Another question for you, Mina, um, at NCATS. Do applications go to usual study sections or are there specialized study sections uh, where people have expertise in a particular type of, of research or business? Yeah, there's actually a... Um, um, a panel of four to review the SBIR and SDTR applications, and these members are recruited uh, based on the expertise needed for each of the meetings, so they can vary, um, the members can vary, but again, there is a dedicated uh, team to look into the SBIR, SDTR um, applications. Thank you. Here's an easy question for you all. Um, I'll start off with um, Joshua at NIA, what time are applications due on due dates? Is it 5 p.m. ET or a midnight deadline? 5 p.m. Eastern. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then the other question relates to, um, can someone apply for SBR funding uh, to reanalyze their existing data in a newly acquired scientific knowledge? And if so, what are the mechanisms for getting funded? Saroj, do you want to take that one? Sure. I, I think it really depends on whether, you know, if, if it has commercialization potential, if the data is going to be a product that has a market, in that case, uh, that may be, uh, that may work. But a lot of the time, you know, you may think about other traditional R grants, such as R21, R03s, and things like that, that, that will, you know, take you towards, um, you know, more data generation and, and and not particularly commercialization per se. Thank you. There was mention of, uh, during some of your presentations of matching funds. Um, does that mean that a company has to match funds or a partnering university has to match it? No, so general, so technically matching funds are not required, especially through the omnibus. For the phase 2B programs, uh, the bridge program that NCI mentioned and the bridge and the small market program that NHLBI mentioned, the matching funds cannot technically be required to apply, but they are written to the review criteria. So, for example, if an applicant organization applied for a phase 2B RFA award through our bridge RFA and they didn't have any matching funds, the application would be accepted. It just probably wouldn't be reviewed very well since one of the specialized review criteria includes did the applicant organization bring in commitment to those matching funds. Thank you. <clears throat> if there is an applicant who has a project idea that ha may overlap with multiple institutes, um, what do you suggest in terms of deciding which institute when? Saroj, do you wanna take that one? Sure, I think, you know, definitely think about, you know, what might be the most relevant one and, you know, reach out to the program officer, uh, talk to them. The other thing you can do is always go to the NIH reporter, uh, put in your abstract and see what are the institutes that have funded, you know, innovations in your space, uh, which institute might be more receptive to funding your type of technology. The reporter does a really good job of, uh, you know, showing you what are some of the projects that have been funded. There's also that matchmaker wherein you can copy and paste your abstract and then that, that helps as well. Thank you. And Mina, did you want to add anything from an NCATS perspective, given that it's somewhat di disease agnostic? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly chime in on um, to what Saroj said that, you know, um, you can actually list multiple institutes to consider co-funding, and that actually opens up a possibility for these institutes to come together and co-fund your application. So, you know, I would suggest that if you think that your proposal is a good fit for multiple ICs, reach out to all those ICs and program officers and talk to them and see if one of them would be willing to take primary assignment on it, and you can list the others as a secondary or a tertiary. Wonderful. I want to thank everyone for your time today. Uh, we appreciate hearing from all the institutes and our uh, partners. And thank you to all the participants who stayed on with us to listen to all the presentations. We will make this presentation available. Uh, we will um, also send out an email with various links that we've been sharing on the chat.
thank you and we wish you much success in your future application. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone.